Uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore is largely credited with creating carceral ge geography, the study of how the interplay between space, institutions, and political economies shape modern incarceration. The author of Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California, and several often anthologized essays. She's the co-founder of several social justice organizations, including the California Prison Moratorium Project and Critical Resistance. Folks, come on in, grab your seats. Uh, she's a professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, and American Studies at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where she is also director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. This is all a lot to fit on a CV. Uh, her many honors include the Angela Y. Davis Prize for Public Scholarship from the American Studies Associations and the Association of American Geographers Harold Rose Award for Anti-Racist Research. She joins us tonight with her latest book, Abolition Geography, Essays Towards Liberation. A collection of her work from the last three decades, it offers scholars, activists, and all the rest of us interested people, a new way of reacting to the incarceration crisis. The Chicago Review of Books praises it thusly. Anyone with an interest in the critical theory of mass incarceration and show social justice can't miss this first ever compendium of writing by one of the most brilliant and radical minds in the field. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Chenjirai Kuman Yika, an assistant professor at Rutgers University he is a researcher, journalist, and artist specializing in media studies. He has contributed to a variety of podcasts, radio programs, and publications that I'm sure you've all heard, including Transom, NPR's Code Switch, All Things Considered, The Intercept, The Moth, and more than I can mention here. He co-hosted the Gimlet Media podcast, Uncivil, and as an organizer, he is on the executive committee of the 215 People's Alliance, and is a member of the Media Inequality and Change Center. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Ruthie and Chenjirai to our stage. Come on, Philly. Good evening. What's going on, y'all? How you doing? All right, well, first of all, welcome to everybody. I'm so glad that we have this time together, you know, to think about things to talk through some things and to travel some places. You know, I try to, one of the things about studying geographers is I'm learning how to think <laughs> geographically. Um, so I'm really, really excited. I can't tell you how excited I am about this book, um, Abolition Geography. And, you know, I mean, it's already been said, and I think everyone here already knows this, but this is a tremendously rich book in terms of its ability to raise our level of analysis and most importantly, our level of, of action and intervention and transformation. Um, and uh, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just, there's so many ways, I'm gonna resist the temptation to enumerate all the ways that it does that. Um, but what we wanna do tonight, we also, it's also, I mean, say, it's really exciting to be here in Philadelphia where- Definitely. In a, hey, y'all. First of all, I, I call Philadelphia home, so that's one thing, but Philly is a place both of intense uh, intersecting crises, but also of powerful resistance. And um, I know that we have, hopefully, and I, we have some folks who are involved in that resistance here, here with us tonight. So we wanna make sure that we, we kind of ground our discussion and bring, bring that, that as an as a important part of this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the book and some ideas in, in Ruthie's work more broadly, and then we're gonna to turn to some more specific things, and we definitely wanna invite folks in to talk about the struggles we're dealing with now and to uh, engage with questions and, and comments. So uh, let's start out this way. You know, I was, I was talking with you earlier that, you know, one of the things I think that's really important about this book, we've seen a number of tremendous works about abolition uh, recently, but the centering of geography as a way to really understand our situation, I think is really important. And one of the things, to, I, you know, one of the ways that the book talks about understanding abolition geography that you talk about it is freedom is a place. Thinking about freedom as a place. Could you, could you help us to understand more, you know, what you mean by that? 
Sure, I'd love to talk about it. And I also want to thank you, Chandrai, for being in conversation with me tonight. Uh, we met in Zoom during the pandemic, <laughs> and we <laughs> had a really long conversation. Some of you might have listened to parts of on The Intercept, two part. There were like five other parts that didn't make it. Yeah, right. <laughs> But we finally have met in real life, and uh, I couldn't be more delighted than to be sitting up here with everybody here and talking with Chenjirai about things that matter to all of us. So freedom is a place. I've been thinking for many, 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 many years, and hello, young comrade in the back, you do not have to be quiet. <laughs> and just generally, that for anybody who comes to a revolution and can't be in a room with children, you've come to the wrong revolution. Ah. So freedom is a place, including for small people and including for old people and deaf people like me and disabled people and everybody um, has got to have a place in the place. And by place, I mean how we combine our energy and our talents, resources, including technologies and money resources and other things, with the environment to make home, to make where we live, work, play, and pray. So it isn't something that's really, really local. It isn't something that's necessarily behind locked doors. In fact, the place of the Philadelphia Free Public Library is essential for all of our freedom, not just some of our freedom. So freedom is a place in which we have institutions like the public library, public health, public education, all of those public goods to which everyone should, by virtue of being alive, be entitled. This is the freedom that I'm talking about, and we make it in a series of actions and opportunities wherever we are. It can be as big as a revolutionary campaign in a smaller big country. It can be as small as a mutual aid uh, society or organization in a neighborhood. It can be extended through institutions such as the library. It can be something that people make across enormous distances and through enormous struggle in the area of building labor unions so that people can have a secure way of reproducing themselves while they labor in the work of production, whatever that is, healthcare, cars, you name it. All of these aspects that I'm talking about kind of add up to how we live with one another. That means as well then, that freedom will, if it is a place, have some agreed upon, but always debatable and revisable, set of expectations that we make of one another as we become radically dependent on one another. Right? Now, if those rules resolve as something called a state that provides clean water, free health care, and so forth, I am all for it. For some people, that kind of resolution is anathema. We'll then figure out how, short of constant voluntarism, that we can imagine making the conditions for our own happy and flourishing and beautiful reproduction possible. Those are some of the challenges that we uh, confront when saying freedom is a place. And there are lots of examples I could give, some of which are outlined in the book. So whether you buy the book or read over somebody's shoulder or otherwise obtain the, pa the pages for yourself, you can see examples of abolition coming into being in a variety of places around the world. It's not just a US-based idea. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to do a lot of that, y'all. I'm going to pause just to. <laughs> not step on brilliance and <laughs> really helpful insights. Um, I want to lean in a little bit more on that uh, because one of the really clarifying things in the book that it was so clarifying for me to read was when you said, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, so please don't let me, you know, 
butcher your what you actually say here. It's all but good. It's like you're like, look, people make freedom in a lot of ways, and sometimes they make freedom. It takes on the shape of a state, and I think for a lot of us who have learned the critique of the state as a fundamental analysis that we need to get free. You know, it's just like, it could become like a blanket thing, right? Like the state is bad. I mean, that's mostly how I feel. <laughs> it's the thing we need to worry about, right? <laughs> and yet, what, you know, then how do we then talk about, you know, uh, aspects of indigenous sovereignty? How do we talk about the ways in which in all these independence struggles, folks fought for independence and control? So I just really love that. And, um, you know, when you read abolition geography, I encourage you to read it slowly. You know, we, we live in a time when we're not, we're encouraged, everything has to be fast, everything has to be interrupted by notifications. <laughs> One of the phrases I read slowly was attached to this part about freedom being a place or how we make freedom. And I believe it was something about people are making freedom against the disintegrating, partitioning, and repartitioning um, that racial capitalism uses to valorize itself or to perpetuate its valorization. Mm -hmm. Could we talk about that part, what we're making freedom against? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the key words there of, of all those words, and I really love words, you might have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> a key word is partition. And partition is a word that you know, comes to mind for anybody who studies uh, history or international relations of the middle of the 20th century. Um, all, or even the entire 20th century, although not exclusively. So some people in the audience might as scholars or as, as descendants of people who directly experienced the partition of India um, mm. would know about partition, or the partition that created the, the divisions and the borders in uh, the Middle East and Israel-Palestine or partitions that um, created the divisions um, within a, a specific territory, but between people based on um, as ascribed uh, identities of race, of gender, of sexuality, and so forth. These are all forms of partition. So Lenin, the guy who waged a very successful revolution about 100 years ago, uh, talked about how imperialism, in particular, at that time, was uh, in the process of partitioning and repartitioning the Earth's surface. And this has always stuck with me from the first time that I read it. And thinking partition in the variety of ways that I just um, proposed to you, to think partition not only in terms of drawing borders and suddenly separating peoples into alleged and allegedly natural nation states, but also separating peoples within territories into a hierarchy of differentiated uh, belongingness that then makes some people more vulnerable than others to certain kinds of harms, exclusions, and violences is how I think about partition and therefore what abolition is in part, is a vision for undoing partition, undoing partition in its many manifestations um, across time space. And let me say something that I have gotten in the habit of saying a lot recently. When I say time space, you might hear map clock, right? Time, <laughs> space, map, clock, perfectly reasonable but not necessarily enough for us. So think about yourself for a moment. You're sitting here listening to me, embodied, flesh, mind, soul, heart, everything, consciousness. So each of us is time space. We are. And we are therefore kinds of places that come together, that combine in a variety of different ways, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes proactively, sometimes compelled by force or other, um, um, uh, other uh, demands on us that would not necessarily be the demands we'd make on ourselves if we had the op opportunity to decide. 
All of this is not to say that abolition is at heart something that's become very popular in, under neoliberalism in the, um, since the middle, late middle of the last century, and that is this notion that choice is what's all important. Choice is, in my view, a um, smokescreen behind which inequality and vulnerability actually lurk and harm. And that rather think, than thinking about choice, and especially choice as it resolves as an individualizing um, uh, capacity, thinking about how we make ourselves into something uh, collective and mutually responsive and responsible uh, suggests that the neoliberal version of choice turns into something else when it becomes the um, imperative for us to make decisions about ourselves together in the world. And when I say together in the world, I'm talking about solidarity, not alliance, solidarity. And for me, solidarity is radical dependency. That's what it is. We've been taught somehow to believe, especially in the United States, that dependency is a bad thing, and choice and uh, independence is a good thing. And I understand why we think being able to choose, I prefer the, the beans to the tofu, or being able to choose, I prefer to be a geographer than a, uh, an engineer. Those, those are perfectly good things, and certainly, all of the colonized peoples of the planet were fighting for something that today we will all call independence, whether or not independence was achieved. So all of those things make sense. But if we think a little deeper into the social reality of our situation, objectively and subjectively, what we keep on seeing is the necessity for radical dependence, which if we go back into the 20th century again, we can see that the radical wing of Pan-Africanism, for example, was a movement toward greater and greater interdependence, which is to say dependency. So it wasn't just a matter of becoming independent nation states post-colonial, but also joining those formations into something actually bigger and more mutually dependent. We can also see that in the Caribbean. We can see it in many places. <laughs> you know, uh, what I love about Philly is Philly is a place that resists and struggles, finds ways to carve out victories. And you know, again, I mean, I don't know if we have anybody from the UC townhomes struggle that's in place in the house right now. Shout out. I don't know if we have people from Amistad Law Project in the building. Um, um, you know, there's, there's just so many struggles here. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I don't mean anybody that I don't name check is not, no, no offense. But we're struggling against intersecting crises. Now, we're told that right now, one of the things we're being told is that the thing we should be most afraid of, in a way, is each other. Um, and that suddenly, uh, not even two years after uh, sort of 2020, that we really need prisons and police to solve what we're dealing with. Um, but of course, we're also dealing with, you know, what universities have done in our neighborhoods, the ways that they abandon people, as the UC townhomes struggle indicates. We're dealing with what has happened to COVID dollars. We have, we're dealing with actually uh, an impeachment of a DA who has, regardless of what you think, I don't think any, you know, not even proposed radical reforms necessarily. Um, and, but the solutions we're being offered are things that have been tried many, many times over at different points of history. And this book offers many, many examples of that. One of the frameworks that the book offers and that's you know, really throughout Ruthie's work, is organized abandonment. Ruthie, could you talk to us about 
where organized abandonment can take us that some of these other solutions don't. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Organized abandonment gives us a way to think uh, very deliberately and systematically about things that happen that otherwise seem to be spontaneous or uh, natural or inevitable. And organized abandonment ranges from such things as this, the UC townhomes struggle, where people who have made their homes and made their lives, which is to say a neighborhood where people have lived, worked, played, and prayed, become suddenly vulnerable to dispossession. Um, and that sudden vulnerability is not the result of some abstract and general and distant thing called market forces. It is the direct result of decisions made by people who have the capacity to take decisions to make people houseless, to remove affordable housing from a, uh, a neighborhood, to make it impossible for people to maintain not only their individual household integrity, but the integrity of the communities um, that have lived uh, side by side for whether it's five years or 50 years makes no difference. Breaking up communities willy-nilly is part of organized abandonment. Now, let me use a different example to show how we can take organized abandonment to a, to a general level and then drop it down to any specific problem that we're trying to address. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, all kinds of places in the United States and many other parts of the world went through a long period of what we now call deindustrialization. It happened to Philadelphia, it happened to Jersey, it happened to Connecticut, it happened uh, to the so called Rust Belt, you know, the steel and auto uh, upper Midwest, it happened all kinds of places. And what it looked like was that something called market forces decided, imagine that, a force decided, to um, remove jobs and um, uh, the wherewithal for human well-being from community after community after community. Now, it is another discussion, which we can have some time, about whether all the things that were made in those factories and grown in those fields should have been made and grown thus. That is an issue, but let's go back to the abandonment part for a moment. Factory after factory closed. How did that happen? How is it possible that people were able to make decisions that impoverished community after community after community? Or another example, probably here at the University of Pennsylvania or at the vast medical industrial complex facilities that are in this city and other such facilities, jobs that had been jobs that put people, uh, kept people on the payroll of the institution and covered by protections and benefits as well as opportunities became outsourced. And people who had been working for, say, the University of Pennsylvania with however weak benefits in a retirement plan became employees of some outsourced firm offering no benefits and no retirement plans. And we see that the people who had the jobs, blue collar jobs like my grandpa was a janitor, my father was a machinist, those kinds of jobs at universities, that those, the people who had those jobs changed as well, right? So one group of people had the jobs. When the jobs were outsourced, different people were hired in order to minimize the political power of the workers in the positions. That is organized abandonment. So the abandonment can come if things are taken to zero. Abandonment can come if things are reorganized so that workers and their households and communities get less of the total value that's created by people working together, whether the product they make 
is educated students, is healthy patients, is a car or a widget or an idea. All of this is the same. So organized abandonment then is a way to think about things that maybe some of you have encountered. If you've looked at some charts and graphs, they always turn up, especially now, that people are focused on the um, economy due to inflation. And we see things like, oh, US workers have never been more productive, right? Per effort expended in a moment by a US worker, the product produced by that worker is higher than ever. And the wages claimed by that worker have gone lower and lower and lower. It's been a bit, little bit of a blip lately, thanks to union organizing, union organizing, union organizing. But this is, has been a fact. So if productivity goes up, which means there's more, more profit available, and wages are going down, which means the profit comes from the wages, which it always does, then the question is, what force keeps that divergence separate? I mean, all us workers want more. We want more, don't we? And I don't mean greed and crap. I mean a better way to take care of our households and communities. And yet, the more keeps going to the few. To keep those two apart, we need a different kind of organized, and that's the organized violence. So organized abandonment cannot be sustained without organized violence. And if we go back 200 some odd years, as Chen Jirai is doing in his study of police, we see it then, or 300 years. And if we go around the world now, in different kinds of places, in different kinds of places, we see the same phenomena appear. And by seeing the same phenomena appear, we can ask ourselves some questions about the specific struggle we have in front of us. For example, the struggle over housing for UC townhomes is at once a struggle against capitalism and against racism it's a struggle against the dispossession of people who take care of one another in the community. It has a gendered dimension to it and other dimensions as well. The particular demographic and other uh, combinations of people and power in the UC townhome struggle is different from the particular demographic and other um, uh, characteristics of a struggle that is going on now in Assam, in India, where the problem is not, say, reducible to something called white supremacy, but the sorting and stacking machine that is making certain people more and more vulnerable and removing from them the capacity to make decisions by removing, for example, eligibility to live somewhere, to have property, to vote, i.e. The, the criminalization process that we know so well in the United States, means that we can use this analytical framework to help us see the problem and then use an abolition consciousness to think about how and recognize how people are resolving the problem. In several places in your work and in this book, you talk about a kind of a tricky challenge, which is that on, one, on the one hand, it's important for us, you know, you talk about the importance of centering the police and prisons as a, as a way to understand some of these other phenomena that we're talking about. You also, clearly we're talking about the central role of racism and capitalism and other kinds of isms, but that there's also a risk because of the way that people popularly understand those terms to render the problem maybe a bit too simply mm -hmm. and to define our work a little too narrowly. Um, could you just say something about how you kind of grapple with that and how you, how you want us to, to take on that challenge as we actually work toward real solutions and transformations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That is such a good question, and it is a tricky one. Um, and kind of you're picking up from the last point that I was making, I hope I made clearly. And that is, well, let me say this really, really crudely, but it's, it's no rude words so the kid can stay in the back of the room, right? To say that the problem that we face, mass criminalization, is an expression of racism is not untrue, but it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not untrue. It's true enough, but it's not enough because it doesn't tell us what to do. It doesn't tell us what to do. Um, uh, very often, I mean, every day indeed, I get an invitation to give a talk somewhere, and people want me to roll in and talk about disproportionality, disproportionality in criminal justice. And it's like, what do you want? Proportionality? Do you want? <laughs> We just want an equal number of people to be incarcerated. Exactly. That's all we. That's what we're looking for, right? Was, but I tell you, that's freedom. I thought. That's. Sadly enough, a lot of people think that that is the solution. They, they, that that a lot of people, including people you know, I love very much, and I have you know those awkward holiday dinners together. <laughs> think, well, gosh, if only there were you know, more white middle class men in prison, it would be fair. <laughs> and it's like, you're, you're missing the heart of the problem, which is putting a human being in a cage. Like, and, and deciding to leave all the human beings in cages who are there, if we only just populated more cages with more kinds of people, would resolve things. Do you understand what I'm saying? So. Putting prison at the center doesn't mean to say there is nothing more important on the Earth's surface than prison. But it does suggest, and this is something I argue over and over and over again in abolition geography, in Golden Gulag, and in talk and podcast and, and other kinds of interactions, that if we start from something like prison, for example, not the building itself, but the entire constellation of forces and resources that make that thing possible. We can take out of that analysis ways of thinking about resolving, which is to say fighting, the problems created by organized abandonment in so many different ways. So for example, a prison, it's a building, right? And the building is made of, let's say, bricks and mortar and steel. Now, bricks and mortar and steel, in the abstract, can be used to build any number of things. You could build a hospital, you could build a school, you can build housing, you could build a, a library, a, a gymnasium, an art gallery. You can build all kinds of things from those materials. There's nothing about the materials that makes those materials necessarily, i.e. destined to become a prison. So what else is a prison made out of? It's made out of money. That money allocated by governments, all of it, uh, allocated by governments, goes to paying the contractor and the architect and the builders and the landowner and the utility companies and the, um, the, the people who sell debt to municipalities to build these things, or CARES money, which is also being used for prisons and jails now, but it's for money, so money. Money and abilities, again, money. Money is you know amoral but politically active. You can do all different kinds of things with money. What else? Labor. To have a prison, you have to have at least two qualities of labor. The free world labor that mines the captive labor. Does that mean the captive labor is laboring? Mm -mm. Pretty much not. They've been idled. They are surplus. These are my friends inside. I don't know if all of you know Stevie Wilson, Study and Struggle Project and other 
projects, have been studying uh, very um, intensively what the situation is for uh, incarcerated people with respect to jobs. And contrary to what you all learned watching the 13th, it's not the expropriation of labor. It really is, and this is really sad and should give us the sense of urgency we need, it's the expropriation of time. Mm -hmm. So not in the same way that um, uh, Elon Musk seeks to exp uh, extract lithium from Bolivia to make the batteries for his cars, or whoever seeks to extract cobalt from the Democratic Republic of the Congo to make the telephones we all use, or somebody else extracts sand from various places around the world to make all the screens we look at all the time, right? Similarly, the way mass incarceration works in this country and in many other places is the fact of having people captive and idle means that their time is extracted and that time is turned into money in the form of somebody being paid a salary, some food vendor being paid for the beans and rice, some utilities company being paid for gas and electricity and so forth. So again, we can, we can generalize from all of these things that I've just laid out to you and said, say to ourselves, every single one of those factors of production could be used to make something else. And the reason those factors are not used to make something else is that we have not made the power we need to make to compel that other usage from, to, coming, uh, to come into being. So this is why we can start with prison. We could start with agriculture and get the exact same place. This is why y'all got to read this. For, I, I, like, like, no, listen, seriously. Like, look, man, we all smart people here with critical analysis. You know, I, I came into a lot of uh, these essays in the book and was like, okay, I, this is going to be fun to read, but I kind of already, I, I, think I, I think I got this joint. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think I know this. And then it was like, oh, no, we need to think about prison as wealth transfer between poor communities. I'm like, oh, wait, slow down. Time. <laughs> The body is a place. I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but look, y'all, I'm like, speaking of uh, reading slow, I also want to shout out, um, and speaking of making freedom, making worlds, I want to shout out Making Worlds Bookstore. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Got to shout out Uncle Bobby's boy. You know what <laughs> I mean? He definitely made a world up there in my part of town, in Germantown. Um, I, there's a, so much I want to get to in terms of thinking about reform and this impeachment, but I'm scared. I was just in terms of time. I want to make sure we attend to this. On the way down here, Ruthie told me an incredible story about all the places abolition can go, which sometimes an abolition organizing that may not have abolition necessarily in the mission statement, and it connects to a really important concept in the book which says, and you know, you know, there's a moment where you say, abolition is a totality, it's an ontology, but one thing that it's not is a form. Our organizing is what gives abolition form. And you gave me a really powerful example of that, about a story about, I'll just say public health. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> public health is one of those public goods that I'll go to the wall for. And, um, meet you there. Um, so here, let me see if I can lay out this story, because it's got three parts as quickly as possible, because I also want to hear from people yes. in, in that audience what you're all thinking about and learn, um, as well as teach or preach. I think I do something in between, teaching and preaching. Anyway. Um, so once upon a time, a long time ago, I, I knew a man, uh, the late, great Michael Zinzun. He was a member of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. He was very active in Southern California in the, uh, from the late 60s when Panther chapters started down there and through his life, uh, which ended prematurely, as it does for so many people, uh, about a decade ago. Michael Zinzun was 
a police fighter. And I mean, he got into fights in the streets with police, which is what the Panthers did early on, um, before they were taken out by the organized, organized violence of the state. And um, Michael, at one point, uh, lost an eye because he was brutally beaten by police and got a settlement, a money settlement, and started a, an organization called Coalition Against Police Abuse that to this day, I believe, receives um, you know, complaints and testimonies and so forth from people in southern, uh, South Central Los Angeles and beyond who have had um, uh, brutal run-ins with police, they, their families and communities. So Michael focused on police, but he also got to thinking about premature death in lots of ways. And some of you might know, but I'm just going to recite it anyway. My definition of racism, which is a mouthful, it is, it is the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. That to me is what racism is. And so we see race by seeing the result rather than race is what produces the result. So Michael Zinson said, well, okay, cops kill us. Sometimes we kill each other. What else is killing us? What else is shortening our lives? And he got onto asthma. He got onto asthma, and in particular, um, the scourge of asthma in low income in his case, urban communities, that is uh, uh, exacerbated and sometimes made deadly by the combination of roach, mice, uh, and rat feces, and the pesticides people use in their households to try to control roaches, mice, and rats. So either way. If you're in presence of the feces or you're in the presence of the pesticides, either way, asthma will be exacerbated. So he started a campaign to get people at first aware of this, but not to turn it into some little you know, household by household self-help thing, although that's how you start organizing many important movements, but also to organize people into tenants' unions and other powerful formations to compel their landlords, whether it's a city landlord or a private landlord makes no difference, to bring housing up to standard so that the need for the pesticides would go when the vermin went, all right? Just about the same time that Michael Zinson had this realization, a group of women, Mexican-American, their self-designation, Mexican-Americans, we might say Chicana, uh, housewives in East Los Angeles, this is the 1980s, had successfully stopped the state of California from building a new prison in their urban community. And although they were successful in stopping the prison, they weren't satisfied with that victory because they were completely baffled and enraged that the state presumed that their kids were going to fill the prison once it was built. So they got busy trying to figure out, to learn, what it was about people in prison in general that made it likely that kids like their kids would wind up there. Now here's another example where we can say, well, it's racism, but that doesn't explain what to do. Right? It doesn't explain what to do. It just gives you a name, it gives you something to raise your fist for, and that is a good thing sometimes but what to do next, having said racism. So these mothers uh, uh, studied and studied and studied and learned something about prisoner demographics and, and learned that a lot of people who were sent to prison then, and it's true now, uh, were early school leavers. They, didn't, they, they had very modest levels of formal education. And then they asked themselves, okay, What's happening in our community now that might be producing among our children early school leavings? And the answer was, a lot of kids are sick a lot. And what are they sick from? Asthma. In this case, the asthma was exacerbated by the fact that where they lived was very near to a major um, uh, freeway, 
there are toll roads here, but you know, highway, big wide highway that never sleeps. There's always goods coming to and from the harbor to the inland uh, areas. So they became environmental justice advocates in order to be anti-prison organizers. Yeah. So thinking about thinking these things together um, means that I wasn't that surprised when I learned uh, from my good um, colleagues and comrades at the Prison Policy Initiative that uh, of the people who are in prison today, so the Mothers of East LA was 40 years ago, people in prison today have very high levels of asthma, like very high. I'm not gonna use that word disproportionate for reasons I think you understand. <laughs> they have high levels of asthma and we can see by looking through asthma how a public health emergency unfolded over these decades of mass incarceration at the same time that hospitals and other um, healthcare facilities were reducing or closing to the extent, for example, that in Southern California and greater Los Angeles in the early 90s, after murder rates has, had been going down, 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 because of gang truces and other, um, other kinds of interventions, very mindful interventions, uh, suddenly it started to spike. Like suddenly, we thought, what happened? Is the truce over? Why are people dying suddenly? The answer was because the hospital closed its trauma unit. And because the hospital closed its trauma unit, the fact that people harm each other by resorting to violence as speech became deadly again. So we still have the problem of people resorting to violence as speech, which is what got abolitionists started on this path, path in the first place. But we can see perhaps by putting asthma together with the trauma unit, the urgency of a public health solution, not to something called crime, but something that is much more uh, profound and wide-reaching, which is to say vulnerability to organized abandonment in general, of which crime is an expression. I think it's time for us to invite folks in. Thank you for uh, allowing us that time. And uh, Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with us. And thank you for giving us this time. My name is Sheldon Davids. I'm one of the representatives of the UC Town Homes Resident Council. <laughs> because we want to be brief, I'm going to skip the personal narrative <laughs> and just say that our resistance, our struggle to keep our homes is grounded in the preservation of an example of the communities that are disappearing. Mm -hmm. The communities that have played a great part in keeping our children safe, even in their vulnerability that accompanies the less enfranchised position of their families. It is still one of the few villages that exists that is required to raise our children. Mm -hmm. And that is a fundamental societal reason, apart from the fact of roofs over our heads, that we're fighting the way that we're fighting. It's one of the few places where folks who are on public housing vouchers can still access public transportation in, with relative ease, can still access medical care with relative ease, can still access major markets and mom and pop stores with relative ease, can still access the place where, when I came from Jamaica, the place I went to every day to keep myself out of trouble because I didn't have any money to go anywhere else, the Walnut Street Library mm -hmm. with relative ease. That was my first library home. That those are the ties that bind us to the 
Western Philadelphia community, mm -hmm. the Black Bottom. Mm -hmm. I can testify as somebody who came here a little less alienated maybe than many persons, including those for whom English was a second language. I had a certain exposure, but I still had to find my way through. And I it was relatively easy for me because these things were accessible. That is my experience. I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. But I believe I can also extrapolate from that experience to say mm -hmm. that as long as folks have been able to tap into the resources that they need to realize their potential, the ability to defend their families from the vicissitudes of the society that is overrunning us remains strengthened. Mm -hmm. It is our wall. And we don't have one because there's an organic security and an understanding in the communities that surround us that you don't mess with these children, even while you're free to walk mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. There's a magic in that. That doesn't happen a lot. So that is worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. The community is worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And that is why the people have said in a unified voice and will continue to say, we ain't going nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Nikki. Um, it's really surreal to be here. Whenever I talk about um, the Law Project's uh, abolition work, I quote you <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about like creating um, presence. Um, so you know we're we're striving to create uh, affirming institutions. Um, and at Amistad, we're really interested in creating a world beyond prison and police. Um, and we couch it in the um, framework of practical abolition, um, or abolition and practice, really. And what we mean is we wanna do more than just ask people to imagine that world, but think critically about what it would take to actually create that world, like at those distinct policy steps. So um, we, are, we are part of the Treatment Not Trauma Coalition, um, which is fighting to remove police from mental health crisis response. Um, we are um, moving to work in a number of different ways to get people sentenced to um, death by incarceration out of prison. Um, and when you do that, when you do that work, you don't have to just imagine what it looks like to have people home from prison. You, you can see um, mm -hmm. what it looks like to have people home from prison in the communities and like what they contribute, what, what um, you know, how, how they intervene like in what's going on in our communities. Um, so our movements are stronger um, because Salim Holbrook is home, because mm -hmm. Ghani Songster is home, um, because Shaka Buna Marshall and Felix Rosado and Terrell Carter and so many others are home today. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that um, I named these men and we're really grateful that they're here for our abolitionist movements here in Philly. Um, but I do want people to understand that um, this movement is led by women. It's led by um, trans folks and gender non-conforming folks, um, or like you know, working class folks. Um, and they've been fighting for a long time to bring this world into being, um, to bring their, their loved ones home. And so a part of our work at Amistad is also to make sure that their stories and, uh, are censored and they are supported in that work. I have kind of a personal question um, about the role of um, academics and scholars. Um, I know that you went back after being an activist to get your PhD, and I'm wondering, do you find that there is a role for the, the academic and the university um, alongside these movements? Um, so my entry point to this, unlike many people, was not uh, present stuff. But, um, but school, so I'm a school, I started off as a school abolitionist, right? Which is something that, um, when you say that to people, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? That's craziness, as you're saying right there. Um, but like, the reason is because um, it, it reproduces so many of the conditions that we were talking about in, the, in, in, in you know, this conversation. Um, and I think also, you mentioned earlier about kind of, I forget your wording, but it was like, um, it, it just kind of 
people think it just kind of arises from magic. It's like, oh, it's just, it's just something that happened, right? But it was something that it was decisions were made by people, and schools are formed the way they are for, for a reason. So, like, um, like it's not that um, schools need reform; they're working exactly as intended, right? So, I guess I want to ask you, like, what do you think about applying that lens of abolition to schools? Because they tend to be kind of hands off, like, oh, you can't touch schools; they need to be funded. The kids need them. We can't touch that at all. That's that's off limits. But mm -hmm. I'm saying no. I think that there's so much wrong with it. But I think where people get stuck in abolition more generally is. Um, in this in this bind of like oh we want to stop the thing that's a problem but we don't have a solution to it right so defund the police sure people are saying no but what else is there what else can we do other than that so I guess if I'm saying abolish schools then people will ask me well what else is there so I guess and I have answers but I'm not going to say them now but um yeah just curious what you think about that idea of school abolition and and, and so forth great and and I just want to say un unfortunately this is going to have to be our last this sort of comment just because we're at time but we can the conversation is ongoing. Yes, and, and we can gather up in the lobby. Um, or I'll, I'll sign books if you're so inclined, and if you're not, we can just schmooze. Um, I, I have a couple of things to say. First, comrades, thank you um, for, for telling me about, telling us, sharing about your struggles, and it, there might be people in the room who didn't know, who might be able to connect and bring some energy to the UC townhome struggle um, and to the Amistad. Uh, law project struggle, um, and so many others. And when I say bring energy, I mean bring energy, like energy enthusiasm. And, um, and it's always the case if you step up, don't do it for a week and then say, oh, I want to do something else. Like, make a commitment. Um, and speaking of commitment, the first question, the one, the one about the role of academics, you know, I, my answer is going to be a little oblique, and I hope you won't find it um, frustrating. Um, universities, like schools, like libraries, like this, this gathering tonight, like the military, which, you know, I am anti-military, but still bear with me, all of these uh, institutions are crossroads, and people meet one another who otherwise would never, ever, ever find each other and can make common cause. Universities have been central places for revolutionary struggle in the world over the last 150 years or longer. And when I say central places, I don't just mean the City University of New York where I work, but the University of Dar es Salaam, for example, was a crossroads in Tanzania uh, for people throughout the struggles, uh, decolonizing struggles of Asia and Africa. Uh, uh, universities in Latin America, universities in India, and so forth. So universities have this possibility. Now, they do exist in, in large part in order to conserve the, you know, the culture and the capacity of the place where they're at, whether they're private elites or public, um, you know, working class schools like where I work. But that doesn't mean we can't use those resources from time to time to achieve something different. If we study Walter Rodney, that's what he did. If we study, you know, so many people, Ruth First, all of those people, that's what they did. So that's what we can do. Uh, but that's different and perhaps, um, uh, comrade in the back, you have this in mind as well. That's different from people uh, rolling out, sitting around an activist organization for three weeks or three months or even three years, and then rolling back to work, writing it up, and publishing it. Mm. That's different. Mm. That's really different. Um, every, everything that I write, I write in order to figure out how we can fight better. That's what, like, every single chapter in abolition geography is that. It might not be obvious as you read through each chapter because it isn't always obvious to me, which is why I write, to figure out what I think, um, what I've learned, and so forth. But that, that's the purpose of it. Um, and the fact that I wound up a professor in old age, like I got tenure when I was 53. Um, I got my first job when I was 49, and I'm 72. Um, it's just, it's part of life. And this connects to the other uh, question, the question about uh, schools. So I assume you're thinking K-12 more than post-secondary. All right. My comrade sister from Amistad said, abolitionist presence. 
Those are my words, and I'm really happy to hear them resonating. Abolition is presence, it's not absence. Whether we think about the abolition of slavery in the US in the 19th century or other kinds of abolition, it is always presence, not absence. It's not shifting a legal relationship or even, as we have successfully done in many polities around the country, although I think this is about to turn against us, reduce the number of people locked up, right? That, that what's abolition is not just reducing the people locked up, but creating the conditions in which those people and their households and communities, whether their households want them back or not, which is not always the case, where everybody can flourish, right? We're not commanding people who don't love each other anymore to love each other once again. And we are hoping that those who do love each other still or will love each other freshly are able to do so and to flourish. So for schools, reinventing, as many people are doing, you know, what happens in the classroom seems you know, essential. Um, and given the talk about organized abandonment, in the city of New York, where I live and work, the mayor, who's a cop, um, uh, just took a huge amount of money, like a half a billion dollars from the school budget, and gave it to the cops. Right? This is organized abandonment. So we say, in the schools, what can happen? Some things, not many things. But abolition, if it's presence, that means that people are making things. People are making things from what people already knew how to do, and I think you know a lot of things that you can do and that you've done with, with people in community. And it also means that people are inventing new things, whether they're long distance migrants, fighting against, wage theft, in restaurants or long distance migrants who are working as nurses who are sending remittances home while fighting against multinational corporations and trying to get Medicare for all so that all of their patients can have free and excellent health care. Right? Whether it's people who are, as the Amistad case uh, example uh, represents, have been fighting hard to get people released from prison one by one by one, that matters too. Justice Now is such an organization in California that did that. There are many others in the country. Or whether people are fighting on kind of more systemic levels, all of these things matter. They, which is to say they who perpetuate organized abandonment and use organized violence to keep everything in check, use all means necessary, all means necessary. So we must do the same. And we must do it in such a way that the work that we do, and this is how many people put it, the work that we do tonight is not something we wake up in the morning and say, ah, we got to tear it down. Right? This, is, this is where the abolitionist vision comes into play, that we don't extend the life or the scope of the system. And that means fighting on behalf of the, of the village that UC Townhomes is because of all the things that Brother Comrade said about that place. Freedom is a place, and we make it, and we make it, and we make it, and we make it, and we make it. Thank you so much. We stayed a little late. I'm really grateful.